You're listening to Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma. I'm your host, Trish Glose, and I'm coming at you from my kitchen. I am rounding out 2021 with David Page, former executive producer and creator of a little show you may have heard of, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. He's also author of Food Americana, which came out in May. I've chatted with David before, if you remember, episode 133. He's retired from network news, so we have a few things in common when it comes to the news biz, and we do chat about some of our complaints and gripes just a little bit. And then we really dive into food, 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 traditions, uh, cultural traditions, uh, especially when it comes to New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And then we chat about the new book he's working on. The title is Under Construction, but he shares a little bit about the inspiration behind this book and why he wanted to write it. Here's David Page. I'm closing out 2021 with you, David Page. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year. Happy holidays to you. Um, I I wrote this down because I know you're Jewish, right? Do you guys, do you celebrate Hanukkah? Yes. Um, I mean, it's not, the reality is Hanukkah is not the big deal Christmas is. Mm -hmm. But over the years, a bunch of parents who felt sorry for their kids made it that. (laughs) But yes, we celebrate. We celebrate. (laughs) <laughs> we give our daughter presents and we light the candles. And, uh, you know, I didn't make latkes this year because um, our daughter was stuck in the city. But um, that's something we often do. Although I learned something today. Hmm. You know, latkes were not originally made of potato. They were made of ricotta cheese and were born in Italy. So they were kind of uh, fritters of ricotta cheese that were fried. Yum. Let's bring that there back. Came to Central Europe, came to the U.S., mm-hmm. made it with potatoes, which are damn good. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I've interviewed you before, episode 133. Um, and for those who don't know, you're a former executive producer, creator, diners, drive-ins, and dives, but you're also an author, Food Americana. You learned so I much. I mean, and I'm not saying that the research on that book taught you everything you knew about food because you were really into it before – this book, but you like that, just for instance, that story about latkes, you have researched all sorts of different food cultures. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nice being able to um, attempt to monetize your hobby. (laughs) I mean, I, I love to eat. Um, and I love (laughs) to try new foods and, you know, I've been a journalist for 51 years now, Mm -hmm. so you got to be curious to do that. So yeah, I'm mm. learning all sorts of things. Just the other day, again, for my next book, Love it. I interviewed the guy who invented pumpkin spice latte for Starbucks, a guy named Peter Dukes. I mean, he, he led the team that did it, but it was a fascinating story. And when they taste tested, they were looking at four different varieties of, of holiday drink. And the taste tests that they did, a chocolate caramel drink actually came in first. Pumpkin spice latte was second, and and he went with his gut. Really, he just figured it was unique enough that it would uh, it would uh, kick some butt. And boy, is it kicking butt! There's pumpkin spice everything. Now. I was just gonna say, was he right? He really listened to his gut. Smart guy. Yeah. 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 He he was. Um, but although interestingly enough, another thing that's happening in the world of coffee, hot pumpkin spice latte has now been overtaken as the top seasonal drink at Starbucks by a pumpkin spiced cold brew. The whole coffee industry appears to be migrating to majority cold drinks. Mm -hmm. So we'll see where that goes. I mean, I love a good cold brew. I'm not going to lie. That well, is my... This is cold. I drink iced coffee all the time. Yeah. And especially even in the winter, in the afternoons, I just want a, oh, yeah. col- a cold brew. It just sounds refreshing and wake you up. Yeah, I actually went for a while. I was making it myself in the fridge. You know, you mm-hmm. put the grounds in and then you... But now I... I don't want to do an endorsement, but I just buy it by the bottle. You know? I know. It's so easy. I, I, but I did the math. I figured out... It's neither cheaper nor more expensive than K-Cups and then pouring your K-Cup over ice. So since we were using K-Cups, I figure I'm flat. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm carbon neutral. (laughs) Good for you. Okay. I do want to get back to Hanukkah, though, because you said latkes. You didn't make them this year. Anything else traditional when it comes to food that you do around the holidays? And we'll get into New Year's, but... Well, what... uh... 
I, I do something that is so incredibly stereotypical but true, which is uh, as a Jewish person not celebrating on Christmas Day, mm-hmm. we go out for Chinese food. Nice. This year we went, one of our cousins on my wife's side does a lot of work in China. He, he owns a company that, that distributes um, arcade games and he has them made for him in China. So he's there all the time. So we go wherever he suggests and let him pick the dish. And this year, my surprise favorite was tripe and tongue in spicy Szechuan sauce. Tongue being the only thing that when you eat it, it tastes back. But um, <laughs> it was fabulous. It was just, fa- and, and you know, there is real, again, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I dug this up, <clears throat> pardon me, in research for Food Americana, but there is a reality to, to the stereotype of, of Jews eating Chinese food, which is that in the 1800s, uh, there was a, well, it hasn't gone away completely, but there was certainly probably more anti-Semitism and racism then than there is even today. And one of the few places that both Jews and African-Americans felt comfortable was in Chinese restaurants because the Chinese immigrants, having been violently discriminated against, did not pass it on. Additionally, and I saw this with my grandfather, even if you kept kosher, there, there was a sense that eating Chinese food somehow helped you become mainstream American. And all these little bits and pieces of non-kosher meat, pork, seafood, mm-hmm. were easier to explain to yourself when they were hidden in little pieces among the vegetables. There, there's a, a Yiddish word, treif, means unclean, meaning non-kosher. Uh, it was referred to as safe treif. I like that. Safe treif. Um, very nice. So I, I just wrote this down. Do you consider yourself, because you have been a journalist for 51 years? Yes. Wow. Um, do you consider yourself somewhat of like, I mean, you're definitely a researcher. I think journalists just by default, right? We just, we are essentially mm-hmm. researchers. Well, if if you're learning things and then digesting them, mm-hmm. contextualizing mm-hmm. them, and pardon the word, regurgitating them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in a way that is approachable to the average reader or viewer, you're a journalist. Mm-hmm. And that's what I am. Yeah. And I mean, I guess what's the difference between that being that and like a food historian? Uh, well, academics would jump up and down and say there's a huge difference, which is that they are doing academic work. Um Yes, they publish, but they publish to a narrow community Mm. um, as opposed to being a journalist where the delivery of the information to a specific audience, be it broad or narrow, is as much um, is as important as the material you dig up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Secondly, historians, uh, unless they publish books, uh, historians. are less concerned with explaining things in a way that the average person can understand. There you go. Um, or pardon this word, which is not a bad thing, or making them entertaining so the broccoli goes down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is part of our job, though, right? As a journalist, I mean, it is it is our job. So we take that information and we break it down and connect it to the listener, the viewer, whoever. So it is interesting and entertaining i mean that's that's our job yeah and and look let's be clear over the years i'm not happy by the degree to which story choices by many journalistic organizations are now driven by their entertainment value Mm -hmm. uh that's different than fake news by the way um Most reputable mainstream news organizations are not making stuff up. Nope. But when it comes to story selection uh, and form of presentation with music, without music, dramatized, not dramatized, Mm. uh, an unfortunate, unfortunate, pardon me, recent dental surgery, my entire mouth is not working. I get it. An unfortunate uh, percentage of, of journalism today 
is selected to be done or selected to be done in a certain manner because of its entertainment value, because of the number of clicks it can generate, because of the ratings it'll get you. Um, I, I'm old enough to have worked for NBC uh, as a producer and, and later as a senior producer. Uh, back in the day when we, honest to God, didn't believe the news division was supposed to make a profit. It was just assumed that network news divisions were a public service. I remember hmm. being going to Ethiopia the year after the big famine um, that many people remember only as what caused we are the world, but it was a, a major loss of life. I remember going a year after the famine with a correspondent and a crew and all of the associated costs um, and spending a week just crisscrossing the country, unsure what story we were going to do, but just trying to figure out what the hell was going on in Ethiopia one year later. And uh, that must have cost, I don't know, 50,000 bucks. And when we came back, we put together a very nice four minute piece and it ran on nightly news. That sort of expenditure has pretty much gone away. Mm -hmm. I've always thought um, the job of being a journalist was always in some form of public service because it it is mm -hmm. our job to seek the truth and, and find out what's happening in different parts of government mm -hmm. or different parts of the world and then report that as a service to, again, listeners and viewers. I've always thought of it as a public service. Well, it is, or, or it should be. It should I be. Mean, look, 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 back when I began in network news, it was. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, look, a couple of things have changed. One thing that, that well, this is going to be a long talk on journalism. One thing that bothers me is that the experience you used to have to gain before you could get a national platform uh doesn't matter anymore mm -hmm. back in the day you know get off my roof mm -hmm. uh, journalists came to the networks after having been seasoned for many years in local news i mean i worked with a producer in atlanta when i was first breaking in freelancing as a producer in that bureau for nbc he took the producer job there after being the news director at the dominant tv station in atlanta wow. dave riggs I, or when you walked past, I remember walking past an office and seeing a do not disturb sign on the door from some cheap hotel somewhere. I said, what's that? And they said, well, that's Kenley. He's writing a script for Nightly. Well, Kenley Jones was in his 50s. He, children were, were not scared by his appearance, but in no way was he a matinee idol. But if he had a piece to write for Nightly News, he was going to close that door mm -hmm. because it really mattered. Today, more and more, the influence of consultants that, that rewrote local television has now extended to the networks. And you see younger and younger correspondents who may one day be good enough to be at the networks, but they shouldn't be there today. Hmm. And you see them walking in their stand-ups for no reason other than um, consultants said people like when you walk and having been in local TV, you're cracking up because <laughs> you always had to walk from one place to another. Yeah. And you see them doing the other things that consultants say you have to do. Get engaged, reach down, pick up a piece right. of rock and say this was thrown from over there. It, look, I get all the tricks. Um, I'm not happy seeing them. And the thing I'm, I'm, I'm most displeased about is that the quality of the writing has gone to hell hmm. in two ways. Number one, uh, well, at the consultant's request, I'm sure every piece on NBC Nightly News, and I think on CBS, begins with tonight, as if hearing the word tonight is going to make you think this 12-hour story is fresh. Uh, number two, the, the amount of uh, grammatical errors. Well, see, that's wrong. It's not amount. The number of grammatical errors uh, I catch every and I, if I choose to watch one of the newscasts, is insane. When I was at NBC, boy, this this entire podcast is an old guy bitching. You know, I edit me out. Love uh, it. I love it so much, no. David Page. I love it. When I when I was at NBC, um, we had a, a guy on staff, Gil Milstein, 
who was an incredibly interesting fellow. He, he was a, a, a noted jazz writer. He worked at the New York Times at one point. Um, he introduced a very famous jazz concert at, at Carnegie Hall. I don't remember which one I should. Anyway, Gill was the ultimate authority on what could get on the air. Mm -hmm. And every script went not just through the senior producer and not just through the executive producer and the anchor, but Gill had final say. And he used to drive us crazy because Gill simply wouldn't accept um, certain phrases used in conversational English that were grammatically wrong. He said, no, uh, take that out. I once got a rocket back. I was working, we we're doing a piece out of Germany and I had allowed a relatively new correspondent to write of a prostitute, the phrase that she was quote, stealing and dealing to feed her habit. Well, I got a phone call within 12 and a half seconds from my senior producer, either before or after Gilwade and telling me, this is the network. We don't write that way. Click. I mean, that stuff mattered. But, but I'm a complete purist. I mean, mm -hmm. um, the fact that the dictionaries have uh, allowed above to be used in place of more than. Thank is, you. It's driving me crazy. But or, or the fact that you'll hear from whence. No, it's whence. The from is implied. That kind of stuff just drives me nuts. But I'm an old cranky guy. I love it. I love how crotchety you are. It's so awesome. I'm crotchety. I would tell all the all the new reporters, do not say over. Over five thousand, whatever. It's more oh, than it's more than. Yeah. You you go you go over a bridge, you walk over something. It's not when it comes yeah, to numbers. And, and by the way, look for complete <laughs> verb usage in most newscasts this day. It doesn't exist. Nope. They're, they're fragmentary pieces of sentences. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not complete sentences. Man, oh man! No, <laughs> I love this but, so there much. You go. Hey, listen, we've lost our entire audience, <laughs> but we're having a great time. I don't care. I don't care. I was going to ask you fine. actually, talking about news because this is what we didn't. I feel like we didn't touch on a lot in the last interview because I do geek out over kind of and I, I, the way things used to be. I just feel like it's so different. Even in the 19 years that I was in the industry, it's just so different now than it was it was then. Um, and I wanted to ask you when you did retire, because I recently retired from news, whatever the hell that means. Um, Never retired. Like, right. Anyway. You, yeah. Uh, it was hard. It was really hard for me. That, that first week not being in the newsroom yeah. was tough, really tough. Because you are able to to have a reaction to almost anything whatever happens it's what does that mean how what can i do about it mm -hmm. how should the piece be struck it's um it's intoxicating and look to this day years after leaving daily broadcast journalism i still read the trades every morning i read ftv live i mean who doesn't mm -hmm. um i, I want to know what news director was cattily addressed by some staff member who's now on secret suspension mm -hmm. you know, it's it, look there's a huge difference between news and gossip but the fact of the matter is at heart journalists are gossips they want to know stuff and they want to tell stuff yep the difference is if you're a credible journalist you you uh, you decide what to tell yeah no i do miss and i miss all of the because i was in a small market and I would get, um, we would get reporters who it was their first job. And I just felt like, let, let me teach them the right way. Like I was always so afraid that someone was going to give them information where they would go out in the field and they would ask for an interview the wrong way, or they would, they would roll up the microphone cord and put it back in the bag the wrong way. And it's just, just make sure you teach them the right things. Well, one of the things I learned when, when I was, when Page Productions was, was, a significant entity we were producing diners and some other things and at one point i had 50 employees or so um i found that i was better off hiring neophytes and teaching them the right way from the beginning mm -hmm. than hiring people who'd been doing it a little while and had learned the wrong way right all i looked for in 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 people to hire for journalism jobs and, and these were journalism jobs I want two things. I want intelligence and I want curiosity. Curiosity is the single most important element of being a journalist. Hugely. Yeah. 
hugely. And I even, there's reporters who have moved on to bigger markets and they reach out to me and in the smaller markets, we had them do so much. And now in their bigger markets, they're like, I'm kind of bored and I feel kind of useless because yeah. the, the the two minute piece that I'm used to doing on, you know, the local county government, whatever, now it's been broken down into a 40 second, you know, Vosot or something. Well, once again, Vosot being a voiceover to sound Thank on you. tape, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, That's David. Where someone talks and then the video continues and the anchor talks. Oh, man. It. You can also, you can, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the VO is first, so it's talking, mm-hmm. then the sound. You can have a SOT VO, which goes the other way. Yes. Yes, I'll translate for the non technical <laughs> audience. <laughs> oh, I missed. I See, this is what I miss. This is what I do miss about news just the news, the geeking out over over analyzing news talk. You said... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I was going to ask you, you said you do you do watch occasionally, and obviously you do critique. So you watch and cr- well, critique stuff. What, what I do is, I, I DVR all three network newscasts. It's do been you? 3, 000, yeah, it's been 3,000 years since I watched ABC, because I just can't stand what they do. I, I, I don't know, three nights a week I'll watch the first two thirds of CBS and NBC and I'll throw shoes at the screen. <laughs> and every now and then uh, I'll drop an email to someone I've never met. Lee Cowan recently did a piece that had an incredible piece of writing. So I dropped him an email and he wrote back and thanked me. Um, you know, I, uh, the risk of sounding pompous. Um, I was one of the people that the president of ABC news asked to contribute to a manual on writing when I was at ABC. Mm-hmm. So um, it is alleged that I know what I'm doing in that respect. And it's so rare these days to, to see it done well. So yeah, I, I throw I throw shoes at the screen. I mean, there's NBC News has decided that the end of every package should be some really dumb, allegedly overarching, but meaningful statement, like a time of disaster in a city that's had enough. Come on, just end one sentence before that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I I watch. I I throw shoes. Yeah. Um, We would have... Okay, we're going to get off news in just a second. I I promise everybody. I'll talk about anything you want as long as my... uh, dental appliance from surgery doesn't <laughs> gotcha. start to hurt. Gotcha, gotcha. If it starts to hurt, it's over. Why? I had reporters who, I'm like, just end on that sound bite. You know, someone saying yeah. something really beautiful and poignant. Just end yeah. it right there. Why do you have to throw in a line at the end of your story? I, I'd never understood that. There's not, you know, there is a formula, I think, in storytelling, but there shouldn't be, right? Just tell the story. No, well, there's one formula. Beginning, middle, end and another thing that you see lately is the first sentence of so many stories is unnecessary a chilling scene on the capitol today protesters scaling the no protesters scale the walls of the capitol today that's the news it's like the joke i used to make and this is really inside baseball to our viewers i'm sorry but um there's a style of storytelling espoused by an organization called the National Press Photographers mm-hmm. Association. And they're very influential in the business and they give out awards and much of what they say is right. But their position on storytelling has always been you have to start with some sort of a strong visual, no matter what. So my joke used to be that just to pick one of their stations, Care in Minneapolis, where I lived for a long time, I would expect to see a story like this one day at Care. The sun rose frigid over the O'Malley farm to the south of Lake Superior. Fred O'Malley trundled to the barn to feed his cows. He suddenly noticed an orange glow to the east Only then did he realize Minneapolis had been destroyed by a nuclear explosion. (laughs) You know, it's the classic bury the lead. Yeah. Bury the, oh man. And that's everyday life, right? Don't bury the lead. Don't bury the lead. Just come right out and say it. No, but I used to, uh, sometimes I'd have a producer present me a story back at the network. And I'd say, why'd you start like this? And Mm -hmm. they said, well, to be different. 
And I said, there's, you know, there's a reason John Wayne walked into the sunset at the end of every movie. Some conventions work because they work. Mm. You know, tell me the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and that tends to get lost amid um, incorrect visions of creativity and brilliance. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about teaching? Um, it's crossed my mind, but I'm from that old generation of um, college dropouts who got into radio at a young age. I never got my degree, so um, I don't think there are many universities that would want me. Oh, but I would I would argue that I would argue that your experience far exceeds a, a degree. I mean, if you if you want to put it side by side, I don't know. Well, any university that wants me to teach, if you're listening right now, I never got past my associate's degree. Give me a call. And look at you now, yeah, David Page. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, I'd love to teach. Um, look, much of what I did throughout my career mm -hmm. was mentor. Mm hmm. Um, and that, that was a lot of fun. I bet. You know, the difference is some people are open to it and get it. And some people aren't. Um, I did a brief six month stint filling in as a senior producer at a local TV station a few years back. And, um, while I wasn't wearing my credentials on a sandwich board, Everybody knew what my past was, and yet I still had a number of uh, reporters who did not want to be guided. I had one telling me, um, uh, I'm, I'm special, what, what I do is terrific, and I don't need any help. So, you know. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. It, now, look, understand something, television news today is filled with people who want to be on television. Yeah. Whose first motivation is not truth telling. Uh, not that they're lying, but please, I don't want any of the fake newsers to jump on this. But their their motivation is to be on TV. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, they're having fun being on TV. They're I know. It's kind of gross, though. It's gross to me. It's yeah, gross. It is, but it's that's gross. okay. I mean, what can you do? Nothing. You still got the New York Times and NPR. And um, a number of highly reputable places mm -hmm. that provide what I consider to be um, legitimate, honest, objective information to the extent that any human being can be objective. And acknowledging that, quote, bias, when people yell about it, it is not that which creeps through from from personal opinion into stories as much as it is in the selection of stories by the organization mm -hmm. the new york times simply because its staff lives in montclair new jersey um or glen ridge where i lived when i was at abc and shops at whole foods and and or on the upper west side of new york is going to find interesting things that to folks who don't share that view of life is liberal um folks who write for the wall street journal perhaps in choosing stories have a different worldview that's where i see the tilt mm -hmm. in major media it's in what do you decide is news very true and that's always a big discussion in in most newsrooms and i will say local newsrooms um I feel are different. You know, they're, they are full for the most part, full of people who are super passionate about truth telling and deciding what is news. Mm -hmm. So I, I do certainly appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask you about this new book because you are the author of Food Americana, which was published, mm -hmm. help me, when was that published? Back in May. Yeah, so you're already working on a new book. Oh yeah, called Eating While Standing. Eating While about Standing. That's the working title. I have to convince the publisher, I guess. Okay, but, okay. Um, it's about all the stuff that isn't served by a waiter or waitress, from breakfast sandwiches at a bodega to um, hot dog carts to state fairs to football stadiums to um, the regional sandwiches that we buy depending on where we are in the country. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, to soft serve, I'm going to include soft serve ice cream as well, which began as a mistake when um, a guy named Carvel, who had an ice cream truck, broke down on the side of the road and his stock of ice cream started to melt. And he started selling the melting ice cream out of the back of his truck. And that turned into the Carvel um, chain and was emulated by others like Dairy Queen. Um, and is a fascinating subject, mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating, uh, especially when you get into custard, which is a similar product with egg in it that's very big in places. Well, Milwaukee's the, the seat of custard in America, but we have some here in New Jersey. So like frozen custard? Yeah. Yeah. It's is ice cream like, but it, 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 so you don't even know the term. It's basically ice cream with egg in it. Um, which makes it richer, uh -huh. and yet it is a soft serve product, and it's terrific. It sounds terrific. It is terrific. Trust it... me on this. <laughs> What's the difference between the like frozen custard and gelato? Doesn't gelato have eggs in it too? No, no. Gelato is similar to ice cream, but the way in which it is whipped and processed, it has. A higher air content and a lower fat content, I believe, than ice cream. Although having written an entire chapter on ice cream, I still find myself confused about gelato. Uh, so if I got it wrong, check my book where I got right, it right. Right, right, right. No, I, th I think that does sound that does sound right, actually. So in your research, um, does it seem like all there most cultures have some sort of food? that we eat while standing? Oh yeah, well look, street food has been um, with us since the earliest times. Remember that for probably centuries, maybe millennia, um, it was highly unusual to have a kitchen. Mm. Um, you, you didn't cook in your house, you had to go find your food somewhere. Um, transfer that to New York when the great um, influx of immigrants came in the 1800s and um, everything was purchased off streetcars. I, I mean, the, the earliest fast food uh, in New York anyway was oysters because at the time New York Harbor was just bountiful with oysters and they were sold off streetcars, they were sold at restaurants, but you, you'd get oysters anywhere in the streets. And um, one of the earliest ways for immigrants to make a living was to sell something off a wagon. Mm -hmm. And Mayor LaGuardia just hated this and forced the peddlers into enclosed markets, which actually hurt the other, um, the other businesses in the area because street carts in the streets would funnel business to them. But anyway... Um, there was a study done, uh, this is an odd fact to know, back in those days when there was such debate over whether um, food should be peddled from, from street carts, that found that the fruit sold by street vendors was fresher and far less spoiled mm -hmm. than the fruit that made its way to fixed location stores because the peddlers would buy it right off the boat or from a reseller who had gotten it right off the boat. Um, where spoilage was a big problem back in the day before refrigeration, whereas the um, the stores, the food going to them went to a wholesaler and it went to a, a warehouse and then it was put on a, another card and taken to the stores. It was older and, and not as fresh. Mm -hmm. Well, look at too. I mean, and you may probably know this better than I do. The food cart explosion, whenever that was several years ago. Um, well, the food truck explosion was in thank the 90s. You. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was started bizarrely enough by Roy Choi, um, a chef in Los Angeles mm -hmm. who, who um, did fusion tacos and um, Asian flavors in a taco. And because uh, social media was just really starting to become a thing, uh, he developed a following by posting on social media where he was going next and he kicked off this whole food truck revolution um 
there were actually a couple of food trucks that preceded him, but uh, he's the guy who gets the credit, which is not to say that street food had not long been a part of Los Angeles culture. Sure. It, it has been from um, as far back as as is recorded, um, certainly after um, California, uh, Southern California was taken from Mexico in 1848. But yeah, that, that started the food truck thing. And, and food trucks are now ubiquitous. They are um, certainly a cheaper way for someone to get into the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. they, um, they're often ethnic. Um, there's two different kinds. There's the, the sort of food truck that, that serves as an everyday eatery for, I can't believe I used the word eatery. I hate that word an everyday establishment for an enclave uh, of immigrants um, or their kids mm. serving their foods uh, that they miss from wherever they came from. And then there's the gourmet food truck, which has become hipper than hip, um, serving lobster rolls or some other nifty thing. Right. Um, and, and look, uh, I've had some amazing meals at food trucks. I mean, my my introduction to uh, Bidia tacos, those, those spicy mm. um, Mexican beef stew tacos mm. came out of a food truck in South Philly. Um, food, food trucks are great. So is it safe to say then social media completely changed the way food yeah. trucks operate? Okay. Yeah, no, it, it, well, social media changed how we consume food in that respect. Mm -hmm. The whole follow your food truck thing um, legitimized the concept of the food truck. And to this day, um, the food trucks uh, do an awful lot of aggregating of consumers online. Mm -hmm. Although increasingly, I think uh, it's... Um, it's Facebook pages to some extent. I'm, right. I'm sure Instagram and Twitter are, are, are still a big deal. I tend to come across food trucks on Facebook pages when I'm researching them. Oh, I'm sure you do. In fact, in there's an interview you did, um, and I was reading it. Uh, you were talking about taking pictures of of food, and social media has played such a huge role in food these days. I mean, because I mean, I'm, I'm definitely part of that as well, because if I have something beautiful in front of me, whether I've made it or it's at a restaurant, I'm taking a picture of it and I'm putting it on my Instagram page. Yeah. But you know, I'm looking I hope for you this. enjoy eating it as much as you enjoy taking a picture. I was going to ask you though, but I, that, that, that was going to be my question to you. One of the things that the posting of food pictures has done, and I do not put you in this category because it, it's clear to me you're, you're a dedicated food lover. It made your food something that made you hip. Okay. If you go eat someplace, whether or not you're into the food, if you post your picture of it, you're cool. You're at the latest whatever restaurant. Yep. And if that gets you to eat good food, that's fine. But um, I never take pictures of my food. Yeah, um, I just found it. You said, um, I'm looking for it on here. Um, you were talking about basically that, here it is. You say, it's funny because on Instagram, there's this assumption that food should be unnaturally gorgeous. Yes, it should be pleasing to the eye. But I think there's something wonderful about a messy styrofoam container filled with beautiful tacos from a truck. I mean, that's how you're supposed to eat them. Yeah, I, I mean, look, yes, there's the expression we eat with our eyes. Okay, fine, we do. And if I'm paying a stupid amount of money for an eventually unsatisfying um, tasting menu, yes, you better use tweezers. But food <laughs> is food. I it mean, is. Pe people talk to me about what should you eat? Do you eat organic, do you eat, do you eat vegan? Um, and I say, I just eat good food. Now mm -hmm. I eat too much of it, <clears throat> but around our house, it's, um, one night I roasted chicken one night, uh, a couple nights ago, I stewed, um, chuck cubes, you know, a very tough kind of meat mm -hmm. in, um, 
and tikka masala sauce. Mm. It, it all begins with something real. Last night I made a frittata, um, you know, uh, a dozen eggs and some hot Italian sausage mm. and some bacon and some thin sliced potatoes and some onion and some cheddar cheese in a, a frying pan in the oven. Yum. That's good food. Yep. You know, I, I, I often laugh when I see people ordering meal kits where the amount of salt is in a plastic bag. It takes me no more than 15 minutes to make a roast chicken. And, and I make mine in a unique, I think it's a unique way. I, I, I line the bottom of a flat pot with garlic, onions, potatoes, and carrots. I put a chicken on top. I rub it with salt, pepper, and maybe a little cumin. Uh huh. And then I pour in a couple of boxes of chicken stock so it doesn't dry out. And I put it in the oven at 500 and walk away. I can do that in 10 minutes. Mm hmm. Why, why do you have to buy a rotisserie chicken? I'm with you. I'm with you. But, I'm with you. But, do but you... I, look, I sound as, as much like a snob as um, Alice Waters does when she says everyone should only buy locally sourced produce. Good luck, Alice. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, you know, f that, that chicken ain't going to be pretty. <laughs> It's not going to be on your Instagram page. <laughs> it's not going to be on my Instagram. Now, the, the frittata could have gone on the Instagram page. Nice, nice. But don't you do agree, though, that for cooking, and I think for you, yeah, it's something that that's your element. That's your that's your place. It's easy for you. There's a lot of people that getting in their kitchen and taking something that's whole and breaking it down, it's, it's intimidating. No, it, it is. It, it certainly is. Um, I will simply point out, a, it can be therapeutic. Yes. B, there's a sense of satisfaction. D, sometimes you get it horribly wrong. Um, complete truth. Because I had so much bacon in last night's frittata and I seasoned it, it was too salty. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you come to my house for dinner, I may make you something I've never made before. And it may be good and it may not be, but what the hell? Right. I mean, you got to eat. Yep. And you have to, you just have to get in, get in the kitchen and do it. And that's what I love about home cooks specifically, because, you know, we're our own worst critic, I think. Oh. But at the end of the day, as you know, Julia Child said, never, never apologize, never explain. Just well, but see, eat it. That's really important that you said that because I am not a chef. I do not have any of the instincts that allow me to just know when something is done. Sure. If I'm going to show off and cook steak for a bunch of people, I'm going to buy an extra one so I can keep cutting into it until the others are done. Okay. Good call. But it's still fun. It is fun. Yeah, it is you fun. Know, I lived, when I was in Europe, I, in Germany, when you rent an apartment, it doesn't come with kitchen cabinets or counters or appliances. You have to buy them from the prior resident. Or in my case, when I moved to Frankfurt, it was a brand new apartment, so it had none. So our bureau coordinator took me to Ikea or Ikea, however you pronounce it, whatever country you're in. Right. And I bought a whole kitchen for like a lot of money. Wow. And then when I left Frankfurt four years later, I realized I had never once cooked anything in that kitchen. I was on the road all the time. It's not like I was just... Mm -hmm. sitting there like a slug. But I did have a Gestetter down the street, which made the most incredible, fattening, terrific schnitzel. So, you know. But, but when I got back to the States, I said to myself, maybe I'll try cooking something. And and that's that's what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and look, if you hate cooking, don't cook. But uh, I, I find it a rewarding experience. I do too. I do too, especially... I, except tonight, because my wife said, I finally got the kitchen counter cleaned up. We're going out for Thai food. Good for her. Yeah. yeah. Mm, Thai food. Thai food's the best. So let's talk about this this book. How far are you along? Oh, it's going to be another year. Okay. Yeah, no, the big, the big event was I went to the Minnesota State Fair this year mm -hmm. with my wife and um, sampled all of the ridiculous fair foods Yum. on a stick and, mm -hmm. and otherwise. Although what's interesting is 
for all the talk about food on a stick and wacky stuff, the best selling items remain hamburgers, hot dogs, milk, because there's a dairy component there, French fries. And actually the, the top selling item at the Minnesota State Fair is chocolate chip cookies made by a woman called Sweet Martha. Well, not by herself personally anymore, because she won't get the, this kind of revenue this year because first year after the pandemic, attendance was down by half. But in the last full pre-pandemic year, her revenue was five million bucks for a twelve-day event. What? Yep, five million bucks. Cookies. And what's incredible? Little chocolate chip cookies, and you get them either in a box, or a bucket, or a cone, like a paper cone. And we we went backstage with her to watch it happen. I mean, it's an incredible operation. And um, years ago, well, she's been there for I don't know. 10 years, 20 years, whatever. When it first happened, she and a couple of partners had applied to the fair to do yogurt. And the fair, which is impossible to, to get into, called them back with like six weeks to go before the fair and said, we lost a vendor, would you be interested? And they said, sure. And they said, but we don't want yogurt. We noticed that you have cookie crumbles on one of your items, could you do cookies? And they said, okay. Well, they were buying commercial cookie crumbles. They had to learn to make cookies and ramp up to do it in six weeks. Wow. So they all got their mother's or grandmother's recipes and they looked at them. And next thing you know, um, yeah, five million bucks a year. Five it's incredible. Wow. from a 12 day event. Yeah. See, and the Texas State Fair claims that it is the number one fair in the country because it has the number one um uh the, the the top number of admissions but it goes for 30 days you do it day by day it's minnesota mm, minnesota minnesota is where it's at chocolate chip cookies wow so and i guess writing this new book like where did this idea come from um i really enjoyed writing the first book yeah pardon me i have to clear my throat no, you're good <clears throat> you're good and i thought what didn't I get into in the first book? And what are the other key elements of American food that would be of interest? And I ended up here. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm planning uh, in, uh, in the spring when tourists, <clears throat> pardon me, start traveling again, I'm going to go up to New England and do the clam trail. There's, a, there's an item uh, beloved in New England and nowhere else whole bellied clams not clam strips it, it's the whole clam when you bite in the body of the clam kind of explodes in juice in your mouth you either love it or you're totally grossed out but there there's a whole bunch of shacks um around ipswich uh that that do whole bellied clams so i'm gonna do i'm gonna do seafood shacks i mean elsewhere in the country uh, you know they'll be different in louisiana or georgia but um, I'm going on the whole belly clam tour. I really dig the way you research. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And well, I all... look, I was an investigative reporter for many years. I ran the investigative unit at 2020. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to research. Yes. Very, um, uh, a lot of investigative research going into this book, which I absolutely love. All of which makes me fatter and fatter. So <laughs> Stop. <laughs> But I do there was think... a way to make that deductible, you know. <laughs> right. I, hey, IRS, I'd like five pounds back. I do think, though, when it comes to food, whether you whether someone's a foodie or a food enthusiast, um, shows on food, books on food, mm -hmm. it it all brings us together because it is something at the end of the day we all typically do. Yeah, I look. I'm not a big fan of of a lot of what's happened to food television in that. It's screaming and competition. I know. Thank you that's, for bringing that up. Thank you for bringing that up. What is it with all of this competition and, and cooking? And I, well, I just look, don't get what, it. What you're seeing is what has happened to all. Of it. When, when cable TV um, was being introduced as the wonderful future of entertainment, mm -hmm. we were told we were going to get 500 channels uh, and each one would serve a unique interest. 
what happened over the years is despite what channels were about, they all began chasing the same general audience. So, for example, the Travel Channel is now doing Paranormal. The Learning Channel turned into Human Oddities, like 600-pound people. And what's happened in the food world, and I'm not aiming this at just at the Food Network. Um, I don't want to disparage them in any way. Sure. But the fact of the matter is, for some reason, it appears that people want to see competitions. Um, there's The Voice. There's American Idol, if it's still on the air after 300 years. Um, so watching people running around to plate a chopped salad in a way that gets them yelled at appears to generate audience. So that's what you get. Um, I can't watch it, but to each his own. Yeah. No, you're right. But I, I mean, look, the, the best, the best food stuff, in my opinion, is now be, being done on streaming. And one of the five best shows of any genre of any kind at any time in my life that I have seen was Stanley Tucci's um, series in Italy. Really? For a number of reasons. Yeah. Uh, first of all, at its heart, television is about spending time with people you want to hang out with. It's yeah. a voyeuristic experience. Who doesn't want to hang out with Stanley Tucci? The guy's 60 but slim. He has the glasses and the scarf. Number two, he knows his food and he knows Italy. He speaks Italian. And this was a deeply researched show where, while it was entertaining as hell, I learned an immense amount. And I thought I knew a lot about Italian food. I learned an mm -hmm. immense amount mm -hmm. about Italian food from just watching the series. And it was wonderfully shot and cut and produced and written and all of that. Right. But it's a phenomenal piece of work. Now, okay. I'm worried because CNN for their streaming service is doing a copycat in Mexico with um, that, that Mexican, she's not Mexican American, there's a South American actress. She was on Sofia Vergara. Oh, okay. She is going to be the Stanley Tucci of, I guess she is Mexican, um, of a similar trip through um, Mexico. Hmm. Will she have Tucci's food knowledge? Will will she relate in that way? I don't know. I mean, I'm open to it. But I thought Tucci's uh, Tucci series, and he's coming back for a second season. I I I rarely get envious when I see um, nonfiction TV. And man, there's two series I desperately wished I had created. One was his, and the other one when it first hit the air was Queer Eye. Yeah. Which was at the time the most groundbreaking, unique, mm -hmm. everything about that show, including especially the way they would sit and watch things unfold on the TV at the end. Yeah. That yeah. was fresh television. Yeah. Now, it got dated very quickly and it was the same thing over and over. But when I saw that first episode of Queer, I thought to myself, geez, I wish I did that. Yeah. And I don't know if you've watched any of the new Queer Eye, but I haven't. It's some of the most positive television I've ever watched. I mean, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear that because I don't have a lot of faith in sequels. I just except for Godfather. Except for Godfather. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which is okay. Um, and and any movie starring Liam Neeson avenging something. Okay. They're, they're not really sequels, but. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's out there, you know, someone he likes got killed and he's going to kick some butt. So I'll watch that at any time. No, I mean, I'm talking about heartfelt, pull it, tug no, at your heartstrings, make your, just make you feel so good inside television. It's just we good. Need more of that. We do. We, need more of that. we do. Um, and that's why I don't like the competition food shows. I don't. I, I don't like them. I also, I got to tell you, I, Gordon Ramsay is a terrific chef. He has. The Michelin stars to prove it. Yeah. But this persona of his where he yells at people. Right. Especially in a time when the sexist abuses of uh, many kitchens in restaurants all across America are being exposed. I mean, um, in, in uh, Bourdain's first book, it was almost dealt with as a badge of honor that kitchen culture was coarse but the fact of the matter is kitchen culture is pretty rough mm -hmm. and has been very rough to women for a long time right the where i was going though was i got into the kitchen at alinea the three michelin star restaurant in chicago 
And I didn't just get in there. I got a guided tour by, by Grant Ackett's The Chef, because at one point we were talking to him about doing a TV show with him. Unfortunately, it never came to pass, but he insisted before discussions could continue that we fly to Chicago, me and my development person, and have dinner at Alinea. Oh, twist my arm. Okay. So we go to Alinea and he wouldn't let us pay, but I, you know, I left like an $800 tip because right. the meal, people made the meal. But the thing that astonished me was when he took us back into the kitchen, it was quiet. There was no screaming. In fact, get this, there was only one gas range in the kitchen. Everything else was being made on induction cooktops, little square things. You know about induction yeah. cooking? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They were cooking everything on induction cooktops that the chefs would take with them from station to station. It was quiet. It was respectful. There was none of this, I need this, I need this. Yeah. It was it was delightful. I, I could have taken a nap in there. Um, that, that struck me as the way a kitchen ought to feel. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, he's uh, a, he, yeah, he's he, a remarkable person anyway. But. Um, and you brought up uh, chef Roy Choi. He's known actually for being very level headed, never yells at his staff, shows them how to do it, how he wants it done, and then lets them take the reins. And I just, I respect that so much because there's no need there's no need to to yell and berate and be vicious in the well, kitchen. Hey, look, it comes out of the old French yes. regimented system that was built on emulation of the military. Although these days in the military, it's it's not a good thing to yell at your soldiers. So. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I'm excited about the new book, and maybe you'll come back on. When it's published. I'd love to. Okay. Anytime. All right. Um, um, the whole reason I wanted to talk to you today was about New Year's Eve and New Year's Eve traditions. <laughs> and I'm well, glad I'm glad we're into it 57 minutes into the interview. Well, there's all sorts of New Year's Eve traditions. Um, for some of us, there's uh, um, there's caviar, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which you know you can get good domestic caviar now at a reasonable price online. Um, and an ounce or two for a hundred bucks or 200 bucks um, on some toast points or, or blinis. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing. It just, you know, for the cost of one ounce of caviar and a bottle of domestic faux champagne, uh -huh. like um, my particular favorite is, uh, is Jay. Um, I so love the, Jay, David Page. That's one of my favorite bubbles. Well, Jay, Jay is, um, it's a wonderful and, and affordable, I mean, you can't call it champagne cause it's American, but, um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. it's, it's a wonderful thing. I think that makes, uh, that makes for a nice New Year's Eve, you know, down South, of course, Hop and John is a big New Year's Eve thing. You familiar mm -hmm. with that? No, I'm from South Carolina. Oh, well, okay. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh. Uh, field peas or black eyed peas um, with greens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's various stories about it. The greens are there because they symbolize money. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is um, they've long been an African American tradition in the South and then expanded to, to all of the South. Um, you know, here in New Jersey, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of traditions for um, holidays are Italian, 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 and it's yeah. Italian American. You know, it's the heavy stuff. It's manicotti. It's uh, lasagna. Um, that that's a, that's a nice way to go. Um, obviously, in the Southwest, um, not just New Year's, but any celebration calls for tamales. Of course, yeah. Which are just you know that's that's the way to go. Yeah. Um, and and um, but not not to overlook just past um, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, um, I did this year what I do every year for Thanksgiving, which is not a turkey. I do John Madden's favorite. I do a turducken. Do you? Which is, I've been doing this for fifteen or twenty years. I get it from the same place down in the Florida Panhandle. It's a deboned turkey. In, except the, the drumsticks and wings are not deboned. Right. Inside of which 
is a deboned chicken, inside of which is a deboned duck, and between them there's cornbread and andouille stuffing. And if you do it right, when you slice through it, it's kind of like the inside of a tree. You get the different rings of food. And the what makes a turducken, and, and when I say I'm going to have turducken, people always go, what's that? Right. And then that's, you know, everyone goes nuts for it. Because what it is, is the duck is basically a source of fat. Mm -hmm. Turkey, and to a lesser extent, chicken, are dry and bland. So between the the stuffing and the fat from the duck, the damn thing's edible. <laughs> This year, my my hundred and three year old mother in law lives in Florida, Aww. and we couldn't get her up here for Thanksgiving because um, she's incredibly uh, active. But I don't want to travel a hundred and three year old in COVID. So um, after Thanksgiving, we froze a couple of slices of turducken, and a couple of weeks ago, we went down to visit her in Florida. We brought the frozen turducken. A few days later, she calls me up at home and she says, I just had the best meal of my life. I said, what'd you have? She said, I ate the turducken. Oh, I love that. Oh, the oh, turducken. Fantastic. Okay. That's fantastic. I've heard of the turducken. I've just never had it, but it makes sense. The duck is really the secret oh, there. Fantastic. In fact, you know, Paul Prudhomme, the, the New Orleans chef claimed to have invented it and he actually um, uh, trademarked the name. Although I got to think somebody somewhere, <clears throat> pardon me, in Cajun country made it first. Anyway, about 10 years after he trademarked the name, John Madden, the um, NFL mm -hmm. commentator who recently passed away, sadly, yeah. um, he is the one who made Drew Duckin famous because I guess he had some before or during um, a game they were calling on Thanksgiving, and he went nuts for it. <laughs> he just went, and from that point on, Every Thanksgiving day he called, he was talking up to Duck. And in fact, before he started talking, I pulled up a YouTube clip. Uh, this wasn't a Thanksgiving game. It was a Monday night game in the vicinity of Thanksgiving where they had a turducken on the set. And he used the telestrator to show how you cut it. And then he opened it. It was John Madden made turducken things. Oh, I love that. That's really, that's really, really sweet. Um, yeah, for us on New Year's Day, it was always greens, usually like, collards or turnips black yeah, but eyed peas associate the, the old legend about green and money did, mm -hmm. did that did you know that yeah that's what my that's what my oh. grandma always told me the black eyed peas are for luck good luck in the new mm -hmm. year and then the greens are supposed to bring you wealth in the new year there you go How'd i don't work i don't question it yeah right <laughs> okay. I, I don't question it i just do it granny says <laughs> granny says to do it so you do it but yeah, that's an, in in my house. Um, it's either rice and greens and black eyed peas, and then some sort of like pork tenderloin or something like that, or grits. Or I always make grits with them. We were just down in uh, Charleston, Aww. and had a few meals down there. What what an amazing! In fact, you know, we went two ways. We went local shack, and then we went to Husk. Mm. which is, you know, a yes. world-renowned restaurant. The food was phenomenal at both places, or all, all the places. The thing that blew me away about Husk, and I was so pleased to see this because food has become such a status thing and the restaurant you have to go to is, you know, you got to pay 300 bucks for a tasting menu. Yeah. The entrees at Husk were 35 bucks. Mm-hmm. I was I was so impressed. Yes. And so pleased. And the food was so good. Although the food we went to, what's it called? Something Island. And now I'm going to forget it. I'm so sorry. Um, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, I did not realize it at the time, but the place has a, has been given a James Beard award as a American classic. Anyway, kind of the shack that, um, you line up at the bar and you put your order in and they give you one of those numbers to put on your table. And we got fried oysters and we got shrimp and grits. Man, mm -hmm. the food down there is incredible. It really is. In fact, I finally learned to make grits correctly when I was talking to some friends from the Carolinas. And I admitted that while I like shrimp and grits, I'm living in Jersey, I use instant grits. Well, uh, the bat signal went up and they sent me some heritage grits. There you from go. From South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And 
Oh, we had shrimp and grits just the other night. My God, they're good. Yeah. Yeah. I cook my grits and for a really long time, by the way. You have to cook them for a long time. Yeah, because the instructions say after you boil them, uh-huh. simmer them for 20 minutes. You go more than 20 minutes? I go an hour. They just... Do you keep adding water? Mm-hmm. You have to. Yeah. Okay, so it's like risotto. Yeah. And gotcha. then if and if you want to get really... I always add water, but then butter, of course, and half and half. Right. And then you just sort of taste it and see what it needs. If it needs more butter, if it needs more cream, if it needs... Would you use stock instead of water? You can. I don't like it. I don't like it because then right. I think the grits end up tasting like stock and not like grits. Oh, but grits... See... Grits is one of those things. There, there are some regional foods in America that are still regional. I mean, one of the premises of my Huge. first book was how so many regional dishes are now national. The understanding of grits mm-hmm. to cook. Now that I know, I, I look on instant grits the way I look on powdered eggs. Mm-hmm. Especially since, again, here's something that's not hard to cook at all. Oil some water. Throw in your grits and some salt and I guess a fat, some butter maybe. Mm-hmm. Lower the heat and stir. And stir. And just watch what, them. What a, mm-hmm. ph- what a phenomenal. And we brought back some rice from Carolina too. Nice. That was just, we had it. What did I have it with the other night? It was just extraordinary. I don't know what I made, but, oh, I know. I made it under slow braised um I did dark meat chicken. I did thighs and drumsticks mm. in a sofrito sauce, um, and made the made the rice and oh, oh I bet, amazing. man, that's Listen, I'm getting see I'm getting hungry talking. <laughs> that's my comfort food right there though grits, rice, anything like that. But I'm definitely a southern girl at heart. So well, so you're a biscuit person. Mm-hmm. I do enjoy biscuits, but I don't like. My great grandmother would make biscuits. I think my family would tell me almost every day she would make fresh biscuits, but they were, they were flatter. They weren't these big monster biscuits uh-huh. with thousands they didn't of have layers. All that baking powder in them? No, they were just re- yeah. they they were just very uh, light. And you would and she would keep them warm in a cabinet, and you would go get a biscuit and some sweet iced tea, and that was heaven right there. But, no, you don't have to say iced. It's sweet tea. Come on, if you're from the South. You're, yes, sweet tea. It's just tea. Actually, it's just tea. Yeah, okay, yeah. Because <laughs> what else is there? Nothing. I remember I, I lived in Atlanta briefly, and I remember trying to order uh, unsweetened iced tea, and I kept getting looks. <laughs> Yankee go. This, who's it's this like, Yankee? <laughs> when I lived in Houston, there was this great bumper sticker that said, if you heart New York, take I-10 East. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Oh, man. All right, David Page, you have been so much fun as usual. I definitely want to stay in touch with you because I want to chat about this new book when it comes out. Hopefully. Love to. It's a pleasure being on with you. Oh, man. It it really is. Uh, Happy New Year. Same to you. Let's hope uh, 2022 isn't the shit show that we've seen the last two years. That's a deal. Okay. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed for that. We'll do a shit show emoji with a line. <laughs> uh, that That's the plan. All right. No shit show. Yeah, no okay. shit show, please. All right. David Page, one more time. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for being here. Thank you. You've been listening to Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma with me, Trish Glose. You can watch this podcast and subscribe on my YouTube channel. Just search Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma. You can also listen and subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts.